That, uh, to me, that is an amazing section of scripture, full, full of action and full of the greatness of God and the power of God. It all happened in three days and it happened somewhere in the middle of the 38 years of wandering in which not much is recorded at all. But without a doubt, it is the event of the 38 years that God really wants to draw attention to. In three days, all those things happened in the middle of a nation as they were wandering through the wilderness. A, a cataclysmic exhortation and awakening, no doubt, to the whole lot of them as, as 15,000 of them approximately die pretty much in you know, but a few moments. And to me, that is the event that stands out above all of them in those, those, um, those two chapters. That event when Aaron is summoned by Moses and, and told about the fact that this plague is spreading through and he, he runs and he gets his censer and he gets his incense and he stands between the dead and the living and he halts that plague. And to me, that's, that's the, the, the pinnacle of these two chapters because what it's, it's drawing us to is, is the high priest. And that's what both of these chapters are about. The challenge of Korah, Dathan and Abiram and on about their position in the nation and Aaron and Moses setting themselves up. But there in that one instance, when Aaron stands between the dead and the living, you see the character of a man who God wants and has chosen to be his high priest. You know, is there a greater image for you and I to be reminded of our need for our mediator and high priest than to see that man standing between the dead and the living, desiring to save those very people who you know, just moments before had murmured against them. Is there a more graphic picture than to see 14,500 people dead on the ground and a man standing there as the plague continues to go through them and for it to stop, for us to realise how God honours the actions of a high priest? It's almost as graphic, isn't it, as the crucifixion. When we look at a man who was prepared to stand between the dead and the living and to give his life so that he could stop the plague for those who wanted to respond. But if you're anything like me, I'm sure there's moments throughout your life where you lose that edge and feeling of the need and the thankfulness that you and I have for our high priest. We lose it. We lose that perspective. And it's only when we come back and read events like this and see how pivotal that man is, how he especially is to God, that we realise how thankful we are that we have a high priest who is prepared to stand for our life. And so we've got a number of thoughts out of the rebellion of Korah and the symbol of Aaron's rod that budded just to to provoke our thoughts and to think about some of these lessons. And there's no way I'm going to be able to cover both of these incidences to, uh, to great depth, but hopefully I've selected some, some thoughts that will help us to, to examine ourselves and to, to stir up that love for our high priest and to realise the honour that we have to be able to call our Lord Jesus Christ our high priest. So in number 16, verse 1, we're introduced to the leaders of the rebellion. Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. And last class we spoke about the Levites because the Levites were that, that tribe that wasn't numbered amongst all the other tribes. And so when it came to the curse that was passed upon all the generation that would die in the wilderness, they were exempt. They were chosen by God to be in that inner sanctum, in the centre of the encampment of Israel to be, to be seen as a witness of God around the tabernacle. Korah himself, if you were to look at Exodus 6 verse 18 to 21, is the first cousin of Moses and Aaron. Amran was the firstborn of Kohath and Izhar was the secondborn of Kohath. Moses and Aaron's father was Amram and Korah's father was 
is her. So there's a closeness, there's a relationship between the chosen leaders of Israel, Moses and Aaron, and this, this challenger, Korah. And Korah, along with the Levites, as we see there in verse 9, had been separated by God for that special purpose of, of service unto the tabernacle. Verse 9, Moses' words to Korah at that time, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. We don't really know how many years prior it was to this when the tribe of Levi had really stood up in that, that moment of the golden calf. Who is prepared to be on Yahweh's side and to stand for him? And the tribe of Levi had set apart from the other tribes. And they had gone through and slayed many at the will of God as punishment for that. It had been the pinnacle, hadn't it, of, of faithfulness. And as a result of that, when they spent that period of time at, at, um, at Mount Sinai, they were separated to do the work of the tabernacle, the service of the tabernacle. But within the, the tribe of Levi, Aaron and his sons had been set apart. Exodus 28, verse 1 to 2, again at Mount Sinai, they had been selected to be the priesthood. So where the Levites would attend to the tabernacle and the service of the tabernacle, Aaron and his sons had been uniquely set apart to be priests, to present the offerings to God, to represent the people. In Aaron's case, as the high priest, to represent the entire nation to God. Well, Korah as a Levite was a man of renown. We see that at the end of verse 2. There were 250 princes of the Levites that were prepared to follow him. Not just normal men, but princes. So we can see there that there's a following, that there's a respect, that is a man that was looked up to. All of those 250 were able to present in verse 7 with, with censers, censers which were used in the offering of incense and in the, uh, the worship around the tabernacle. So all of them were, were involved in the keeping of the tabernacle and the worship around it. And they were prepared to follow this man, Korah. They saw him as a man that was to follow. But Moses has identified in verse 9 that their role in the overall worship of the tabernacle had become a small thing unto them. Korah had lost his perspective on the work that God had given him. Particularly we see about Korah, in verse 10, that he sought the priesthood, and at the end of verse 11, what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? So it seems to really pinnacle down that Korah's challenge is about the high priest role. And it's, it's a bit more developed than that as well, because when you look in verse 24 and 27, you get mentioned there that there's the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So it seems to indicate that there's some sort of alternative camp where if you were prepared to put your cards in with Korah and Dathan and Aviram, that there was actually a place that you could go and you would be with like minds. Whether it was a, an order of worship that was held there that was totally contrary, uh, uh, sorry, that was totally happening right next to the tabernacle, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced by that. But I think there definitely is some sort of a community there, a rallying point where they knew they would find like minds, like murmurers, those that were, were seeking that position um, in the priesthood and, and, a, and a higher rank than just being the, the mundane Levites as they had begun to see themselves in keeping the tabernacle. Well, that's one party. It's probably the main party and the leading party. But there was also, back in verse 1, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. And you see from that picture up on the screen there that, that the Kohathites and 
the Kohathites here, or here's the tabernacle in the middle of, of the encampment. The Kohathites, which was the group of people that, um, that Korah belonged to. And there we got Reuben, camped on the same side of the encampment of the nation of Israel. So they're in some sort of proximity. Reuben was an interesting tribe, of course, because he was the firstborn of Jacob. But he hadn't been given that preeminence in blessing. In Genesis 49, verse 3 to 4 and 9 to 10, you, you, you sh are shown there that Reuben, because of his, his, um, his relationship with his, his father's wife, had lost that right as the firstborn. And Judah had been exalted above him. And that happened even in the way that the, the tribe... The, the, the tribes or the nation marched in the wilderness that Judah would take that forefront role in front of Reuben. As a tribe, they had lost their, their, their preeminency. And Dathan and Abiram, likewise as Korah, were famous men. In Numbers 26 verse 9 particularly, it says that they're men of name, men of renown. They were people that liked leadership and their desire was to be the civil ruler of the nation. Their, their challenge really was against, against Moses and you see that if you, uh, if you flicked over and see in verse uh, 13 that their challenge is that Moses has made himself a prince over us. There's this grating about the fact that he had that position of, of leadership. In fact they're a really nasty bunch when it comes to it in verse 13 uh, for 12. Moses in, in quite a reasonable way of dealing with this, this rebellion, sends to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliath, and said, will you not come up? Come and talk these, the, the issues through? And they say, we will not come up. And then they, they play tricks. They, they say, is it a small thing, which is an echo back to verse 9. Verse 9, Moses had said to Korah, is it a small thing, the role that you've got as Levites? But they refuse to come up, but they've already spoken to Korah and they play that same phrase back to Moses. Well, is it a small thing to you that you brought us up out of the land of, that floweth with milk and honey to kill us? Is it just you know, a light thing that you look at? And it seems to me that they refer to Egypt when they speak about the land that flowed with milk and honey, hearkening back to what they had before they were taken out into wilderness. Is it a light thing, Moses? And then they taunt him at the end of verse 14. Will you put out the eyes of these men? Will you be like you know, one of the, the cruel kings of the nations around us? And we see that later with the example of Zedekiah. We see it with, with Samson. It was, a, it was a punishment, wasn't it? To not kill someone, but to take away their sight. You're going to become like that? Are you going to punish those that dare to stand up with by taking away their sight? It's quite a nasty bunch, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a group that were formidable as far as the challenge. But I think um, one of the points that we can take from that first little opening is that the company we, we keep definitely affects the way we think and act. Korah had managed to get 250 of these princes around him. He'd managed somehow to, to, to make that connection to Reuben and to find those like-minded murmurers of great men that, that could build some sort of a party that would push against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. The company we keep definitely affects the way we think and act. Even in the ecclesia, the spirit of discontent can fester. The challenge is that the nearer to Christ we are, the better our mind will be. If you turn with me to Second of Peter chapter one, it's a bit of an insight into the spirit of these men. It also provides a little bit of a maybe a a stretch length, I'm not sure, back to what we looked at last time. You might remember last time that we spoke about presumptuous sins. The sins of ignorance could be forgiven, but the presumptuous sins or someone that had knowledge and continued to act in a way that was contrary to what God had instructed 
was committing a sin of presumption. A sin where, where they were basically saying that they knew better and they were prepared to go against whatever the right or the hand of God was telling and therefore God was unwilling to forgive them that sins. And that word presumption actually turns up here in verse 10 of chapter 2. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. We'll have a look at that in a moment. The second of Peter chapter 2 is a chapter that is a warning to those around the, in, in Peter's time, around the time of Nero, about false prophets. And particularly here in verse 4, just to, to help us nail this context to Korah, Dathan and Byram, it says there, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And those that have done a bit of first principle would know that, that word hell there is the Greek word tartaros. Or it means the deepest abyss of Hades. So it's not the, the normal word, uh, it's not Gehenna, um, or it's not Hades. It's actually talking about the deepest part of Hades that you possibly can get. And it seems to be a good fit here as it, it talking about false prophets, that when you flick in your uh, mind's eye back through the Old Testament of any incident that actually happened where something or angels people who were prophets speaking the word of God or messengers of some sort were swallowed up into the depths of the earth that really there is only one example. It's the one that we've read tonight of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. But in context, it's interesting just to read a few verses around it and to see the types of the people that God is describing here. Firstly, in 1 Peter 1 verse 21, the prophecy came not in old, sorry, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any in private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time or at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there are now amongst those Christians in the time of Peter. So it's talk, harkening back to a previous time. It's harkening back to a previous time when the scriptures as they had them there in, the, in, in this period of time, the, the history of Israel and what had been recorded, where God had specifically chosen men, holy men, set them apart, not, not, not by the will of man, not something that man could instigate, but something that God was carefully choosing, God was, was in control of. And that will come into our talk a little bit later. So that's... That's the context we're looking at, but there were false prophets also among the people. Those that were speaking words that weren't God. Those that had other reasons for doing that rather than promoting what the thinking of God was. And those men, in verse 9 and 10, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of the temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, margin, dominion. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And here you start to feel the echoes, don't you, of, of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. They despise dominion. They despise those that might rule over them. They were presumptuous. That is, they had their own plans. They had their own purpose. They had their own direction. And they weren't afraid to speak about those that might be trying to rule over them. There was no respect. If you turn over the page, you see another interesting little thing about these men. Because these men were very good at words. They were men of renown. They had relationships. They were able to build this following amongst uh, the, the princes that would follow after them. But there's a warning here from Peter about their words. They, their words are wells without water in verse 17. For when they, they speak great swelling words of vanity, verse 18, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. So they put out these enticing words, these, these words that, that look good and appeal to the lusts, to those that did have a good conscience at some time. Verse 19, they promise liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. And so we can see this sort of spirit amongst the, the false teaching and words of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. They spoke 
words of hope to those that wanted to follow, words of promise, words of leadership, words of position. If we can usurp over, over Moses and Aaron, then you will have this great position in, in the nation of Israel. But they're empty. And they're empty because they can't fulfill them. They're empty because they presumed that they understood what the position of Moses and Aaron was in that nation. There was no way they could be a high priest like Aaron. There was no way they could be a leader like Moses because the very root character of them was different. You look in Psalm 106, as we start to look at the characteristics of these leaders that were standing against Moses and Aaron. Psalm 106. I've got up there's a little bit a few verses afterwards it should probably be starting back in verse 14 they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the world in the desert and he gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of Yahweh the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram and a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. So there in a few verses that are captured in the context of the punishment of Dathan and Abiram and Korah, Dathan and Abiram is this description of those that would lean in their soul, hungry, empty. And they were empty because they envied Moses and Aaron the saint of Yahweh. You know, it says in, uh, in Proverbs when it speaks about envy, in Proverbs 27 verse 4 it says, all right, there's anger and there's hatred, but who is able to stand against envy? Envy is strong. Envy is unforgiving. Envy can never see good. In Proverbs 14, verse 30, it says, Envy is the rottenness of the bones or the decay of the bones. Envy is something which just dwells within and continues to gnaw. And it ends up consuming anything that's good, just like the decaying of a bone. So a structure that was strong and healthy, through envy it just rots and decays and loses its strength because it's just focusing on that one issue. That's exactly why the Jews rejected our Lord Jesus Christ. It's exactly why Joseph was sold into Egypt by his brethren. It's exactly why the Jews could not accept the teachings of the Apostle Paul. It was envy. Consumed by envy and unable to accept someone that had been chosen above them. And yet there's this total contrast to the man Moses. Moses who in the response of this challenge from Korah, Dathan and Abiram, driven by envy, driven by possession, driven by desire, rather than standing up against that, right through Numbers 16, we're told three times that he fell upon his face, him and Aaron. Oh, he could definitely be angry. Moses had been angry at the golden calf. But he could be compassionate. Even at the golden calf, he was prepared to seek for the people's forgiveness. With Miriam, he had beseeched God to heal her leprosy. Even with the evil report of the spies, he stood up for the people that they would not be punished, but that they would be pardoned by God. 
when God said that he was prepared to blot out a whole nation and begin with Moses again, Moses wouldn't have it. He stood up for the people because it wasn't a position that he wanted. And so in two parts, you've got these, these leaders that are coming up against Moses who are, are driven by presumption of what that position was that they were going to gain and stirred on by this depth of envy, coming against a man who, who had no desire for that position other than the fact that he had been chosen by God to fill it. There's a point of exhortation I have there. We, we need leaders, there's no doubt about that, but not driven by envy or power. The godly acknowledge that God is their leader and they shepherd in loving meekness, which is how, of course, Moses is described. I think it's uh, seen here that, that one of the things that they've got slightly out of kilter here in number 16 with their challenge is this concept of holiness. You see in verse 3 the challenge of Korah, Dathan and Byron against Moses. They gather themselves against Moses and Aaron and said unto him, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. All of us are holy, every one of them. And Yahweh is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. The point that I really want to look at here is that separation does not mean that a person is holy. Just because a nation was called out of Egypt, it did not mean that they were holy. Exodus 19, where this, these words are being quoted from, clearly shows that there is more to holiness than just being a called nation. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, it seems like in their accusation that they had very quickly attributed to themselves that they were a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But they had forgotten the beginning. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Now back in Numbers 16, you remember that at the end of Numbers 15, we, we looked at the, uh, the ribbon of blue that was around the, um, or that was, they were told to put around their clothes. So one of the other few things that was mentioned in these 38 years. In verse 40, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. That was the whole purpose of this ribbon of blue. That ribbon of blue, I don't know if you can remember, but it, it connected back to the high priest. The high priest had that ribbon of blue that was tying that plate to his head that had holiness unto Yahweh. But it wasn't just about being called to be separate. It was actually about being separate that made them a holy nation. Now possibly Korah and the Levites, having had that special position chosen for them to be around the tabernacle, had lost that perspective. They were about looking after the tabernacle and being busy in the, the role that they had been separated to do. But did they really realise what holiness entitled? Well Moses did, Exodus 3. It was the first lesson that God brought to his attention when he called him out of the wilderness in Paran. You know it well, I'm sure, in Exodus 3, the burning bush. Verse 5, the voice said, Draw nigh, not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou art standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now you just wonder, don't you, there, there's that, that immediate reaction to the holiness of God as Moses was introduced to him in Exodus 3. Here when the challenge of holiness, that, that, that the Levites themselves were holy enough to take over the priesthood, is put before Moses. 
his first initiation is to fall upon his face. There is no doubt at all that Moses understood what this challenge of holiness entitled. He grasped what the holiness of God was about. He had been up the mountain. He had spoken to God face to face. There was no presumption in his mind. He understood the feeling of uncleanness before God. Isaiah 6 verse 3, the seraphim say, Holy, holy, holy. The immediate response is from Isaiah, I am of unclean lips. Moses understood that. Moses understood that to be set apart, to be holy, to have a position of leadership where God would draw near unto you would bring you into that, that feeling of uncleanness. Not of envy, not of presumption, but of smallness and unworthiness. Brother Harry Tennant says in, in, in Moses, my servant, about this little section of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, even if they did have holiness, it would have derived from God and not from any right or privilege which came of themselves. And I think that's a warning for us, isn't it? Because it's one of those things, perhaps, that subtly in the back of our minds we fall into that thinking of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, being busy in the truth, being close to the word of God, that somehow we are holy by being in a community. But it's not like that at all, is it? Our holiness is actually by doing the things that we're called to. And it's not our own holiness. It is the holiness which is through doing the word of God. Never assume holiness. Our holiness is solely derived from God. And remembering this helps us not to be a respecter of ourselves or other persons. Remembering that by being holy, by living a good way of life that is complemented by others, isn't a reason for us to feel proud about the way that we live. Rather, it's a reason for us to give thanks to God that we have a way to live that shows his character and shows our holiness to others. You know, when we look at the, uh, the theme of choosing, it comes out a number of times in Numbers 16 and 17. In verse 5, the end of it, um, when Moses speaks to Korah, he says that God will come near unto him whom he hath chosen. In verse 7, he says, go and take these senses and get prepare yourself for whom Yahweh doth choose, he shall be holy. And then later on in Numbers 17 verse 5, it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. Moses had lifted this challenge from Korah, Dathan and Byram not to a position that could be taken by the will of men but rather it was a position that had been chosen by God. And when we consider Moses and Aaron's choosing by God, it is so much different to the spirit that was shown, is being shown here by Korah, Dathan and Abiram. Again, come back to, uh, or with your, sorry, before we go there, in Numbers 16, uh, verse 28, you see there that, that Moses speaks about his choosing as when God sent me. So verse 28, Moses said, Hereby you shall know that Yahweh hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. Um, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then Yahweh hath not sent me. So he doesn't even use this word of him being chosen. He uses this word sent. And if you go back to Exodus 3, you can see why Moses uses this word sent. Because in Moses' mind, his position was not one that he grasped for. It was one that he was... He was, um, he was compelled by God to take up. In Exodus 3 verse 11, after the burning bush here again, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, Certainly I'll be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, 
the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said, I will be who I will be. There was no will or desire by Moses to take up that position. He was a shepherd at the time. He had fled from Egypt, as we know. For 40 years, he had already been in the wilderness. And here was God compelling him back to a purpose that God wanted him to do. The token and the sign? Well, the sign was that when they came out of Egypt, that they would come back to this mountain and there they would serve God. You know, the, it's interesting that of the 40 years wandering, the most that is recorded is about the time that is at that mountain. It's almost the thing that Moses focused on because it was, it was the evidence, it was the proof that God was with him. Not a position that he desired for, but a position that God had fulfilled through him. You think what happened there? The Horeb was on fire and he went up into it. He spoke to God face to face. He received the tables of testimony. He got the pattern of the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle, received the law, and established the priesthood that could bring the nation to, 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 to God. And here he was, an unwilling shepherd, chosen by God. And just imagine him there through that period as the nation came together and he could see that structure forming around the God who would be. I am that I am. I will be in whom I will be. And before him is a nation that is changing, a nation that has been given that structure to draw to God. That was the witness that God was with him. You think there were so many other miracles before that, but that was the one that God said would be the witness to him when that nation came and worshipped at that mountain, Mount Sinai. And Aaron, of course, was chosen by God at Mount Sinai to become the priest. In Exodus 28, verse 1 to 2, and we, we won't turn there, but there Aaron and his sons were set apart, and particularly later in that chapter, Aaron is chosen to be the high priest. But you know, on the first day that Aaron and his sons officiated as priest, he lost two of his, priests, his sons. You remember that, don't you? Leviticus 10, verse 1 to 2, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offered strange fire to Yahweh and died. And here in Numbers 16, it's the exact same challenge being thrown out to the sons of Levi. Go and get your senses. Bring your incense. If you think you're holy, then come and offer them before God. You know what the consequence is. If it's strange fire, then it will be death. If it's acceptable before God, then it will rise as that sweet-smelling savour. Aaron knew what it was about. And in Hebrews 5 verse 4, we get defined here in the New Testament about the choosing of a high priest. And I think when we step back and think about this role as a high priest... It's not really a role that you could aspire to with lightness. It is a role where a man of strength, of faith, is required. A man who can stare death in the face. A man who, a man who is compassionate. A man who is able to give wise counsel, but a man who is prepared to stand next to God, to stand for God, to make his thinking like God, to put on a perfect example as best as he can for those that are coming to him. For he is chosen to be the reflection of God to them. Hebrews 5 verse 1, Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So he's there to resent the people, but he's there to bring those people to God, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is, is compassed with, with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. Verse 4, No man takes this honour unto himself, 
The word honour means value, precious, of great cost. No man takes that honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Yeah, the calling of Aaron is not a light calling. It wasn't a position that was one to be taken lightly. It was a position of value. It was a position of, of empathy. But it was a position of holiness. The spirit of Korah doesn't really line up with that feeling, does it? Korah didn't really understand that position that he was ascribing to. And I think when you see the dramatic end to the challenge, the, uh, the fire that consumed Korah, and the, gray, the, the, the earth that opened up and that swallowed Korah, Dathan and Abiram, you realise just how, how, how wrong they had the perspective or the position that Moses and Aaron had in that nation. The punishment showed just how far they had a, mis, mis, a misconception of what they were striving to, to take. The exhortation I've got there probably doesn't exactly fit what I, I just finished on, but the exhortation that God has chosen the way of salvation. There's no way that Korah, Dathan or Abiram could, could presume to change the way that God had appointed for that nation to come to learn of him. God's chosen the way of salvation and it's the same for us. There's no other way other than through Jesus Christ, our high priest, by which we can be saved. Now Aaron's rod that budded becomes a pinnacle to, to this event because unlike the other events in Numbers 16 that were sort of initiated by the actions of the people, Numbers 17 is initiated directly by God. You see in verse 1, Yahweh spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, go and get these 12 rods and put them up in the tabernacle and there will be a sign that will prove that the tribe that comes out with this unique uh, blossoming or, or, or some sort of change to the rod is the one that I have chosen, verse 5. So it was initiated by God. And the context of it is just death. Verse 49, they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside the 250 that died with Korah, plus their, the, the children and the wives and the whatever went down with the tents. But there was... A major context here of death that had happened just the day before, the two days before. And God then goes about setting this sign that would be a remembrance of the events that had happened so that there would no more be any murmuring against Aaron. But God doesn't think how we think, does he? He doesn't pin up the fact that 15,000 people had died. Rather, he chooses a sign that is a sign of life the almond blossom, the awakening flower. The almond, of course, is the, the first flower that starts to blossom well before spring actually comes and it, it points out to the fact that spring is coming. And so often we talk about Aaron's rod that budded as this symbol of life from death. And I think that's, that's probably true. But I think there's also a primary um, picture in this rod that was probably came out more prominently as a, a lesson initially to the nation of Israel. You see, on the rod, when it was taken, brought out of the tabernacle by Moses in verse 8, you see that at the same time, there was budding and there was blossoms and there was almonds all upon the branch. And they literally are the, the, all stages of the fruit coming off that, off that branch from from it just germinating to it becoming a flower to it becoming the fruit itself, all hanging on that branch. Well, there's one other place in the nation of Israel at that time that 
there was more than one status of it all on, on, on a branch at the same time. There was a branch and there was a flower and there was an almond. And it's in uh, Exodus 37, verse 17. Exodus 37, verse 17, it's, it's the candlestick. The candlestick made of pure gold. His shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers were all the same. The six branches going out of the sides thereof, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side thereof, three branches out of the candlestick of the other, three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch, a knop, and a flower and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knop, or shall we say a bud, and a flower. So throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. So when you come back to number 17 and you think of that rod that was brought out of the tabernacle, there it was really representing something that was already in that tabernacle, the lampstand. But the difference with the rod that was brought out by Moses here in Numbers 17 is that it had a name on it. The name that was written on that branch was Aaron. The meaning of that name means the light bearer or the light bringer. So could you get a better symbol as it were to, to sign or to show the fact that you had chosen this man to be the light to the nation? He was going to be the one that would illuminate the tabernacle for that nation. He was going to be the one that would expel the darkness so that they could see the light. He would be like the lampstand to that nation. And our Lord Jesus Christ is exactly the same, isn't he? In John 1 verse 1 and 5, he is the light that brings life. But in John 3, I think there's an even better exhortation about the way that light and darkness interact. John 3 verse 18. He that believeth on Jesus is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be discovered. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest and shown, that they are wrought in God. You know, here is the lesson or the, the, the real essence, I guess, of what the, the exhortation about light is, isn't it? There is darkness. There is Korah, Dathan and Abiram. There is envy. There is the spirit of presumptuous, which is an unforgivable sin. And here is a man who had been put up as the spirit of light in the middle of that, that, that nation of Israel. If their deeds were good, they would come to that light. If they really were holy, not just separate, then they would love to come to that light, that their, their deeds may be shown, deeds that could be shown to be wrought in God. So I think there's a, a fantastic primary example there, that a lesson that would have come straight to the the people of Israel, as they saw that rod being brought out. Not only was it a symbol of life, but it was a symbol of the lampstand and light and everything that God wanted Aaron to be seen as, as the high priest of that nation. The other thing that's interesting, I think, with this, this type of the rod is that prior to this, in the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, there were already two things. The first thing that went into the Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot of manna, that symbol of eternal life, unattainable to, to mortals, but eternal for all generations. The second thing that went into the Ark of the Covenant was two tables of the covenant or testimony. They defined what God desired, but in defining it, they also showed what the knowledge or, or they gave the knowledge of sin and the worthiness of death. How could one attain the eternal life 
if they were condemned to death by the other? And the answer was the third thing that went into that Ark of the Covenant, wasn't it? It was the high priest. The high priest that could bring light and life. It was the thing that brought those two symbols together. A high priest chosen by God, that God was prepared to hear the cry of and to, and to forgive those that were calling upon uh, forgiveness through him. So in exhortation, God's illuminated a chosen way to eternal life. If we do truth, then we can draw near to it and our deeds will be seen to have been wrought by God. So this, this I know I've just picked little uh, themes, I guess, from the incidents of the rebellion that we've seen. But there's quite a, a good list of take-home exhortation points when I think we reflect back over what we've covered. The company we keep definitely affects the way we think and act. The nearer our mind is to Christ, the better our mind will be. We need leaders, but not driven by envy or power. The godly leaders acknowledge God as their leader and shepherd in loving meekness. Never assume holiness. Our holiness is solely derived from God. Remembering this helps us not to be a respecter of ourselves or other persons. God has chosen the way of salvation. There's only one way. If it isn't through Jesus, then it isn't able to save. God has illuminated the chosen way to eternal life. If we do truth, we will draw near to it and our deeds be seen to have been wrought by God. So in that 38 years of wandering, I think uh, this, this rebellion that came out, this uh, real ugly head of a group of people that presumed that they thought better and knew better how to lead the nation than the chosen uh, leaders that God had chosen is really brought out as an example, isn't it, of, of, of ha how, how we should not look at leadership. Rather, it's for us to look and to love and to realise that we have a high priest who is our leader, one that we can never presume we could take the position of. And thank God that he will stand between the living and the dead to give us the hope of life.